switching to GI has been a huge, uh, really opportunity for growth for me and others uh, in the field. Because if you show any positive signal, it really goes a, a, a huge uh, way uh, for a trial. If you start a project, finish it, see it to a conclusion. I think, you know, all of us need to be more um, daring, take risks and go for really big discoveries and not just incremental changes. Good day, everyone, and uh, welcome to today's edition of uh, Onco Influencers. I am your host, Ravi Kara, an editor with Onco Daily. We are excited to have Dr. Elena Jangjigian with us today. Dr. Jangjigian is a professor of medicine at uh, Will Cornell Medical College, New York, USA. She is the head of uh, gastrointestinal oncology at the prestigious Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, New York, US. Elena obtained her uh, medical degree from uh, New York University School of Medicine. She also trained in internal medicine from uh, New York University School of Medicine. She completed her uh, hemato-oncology fellowship from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She is a very well recognized key opinion leader across the globe in gastrointestinal cancers, specifically esophageal and gastric cancers, and as an investigator has led and participated to multiple practice-changing clinical trials in these tumor types with targeted therapies and immunotherapies. Elena, we are very glad to have you today. Thanks for your time. Oh, Ravi, uh, thank you for the opportunity. And of course, to you and Anko Daily for everything that you do for the education um, and advancement of our important uh, advancements in gastric and esophageal cancer, but also for all tumor types. So thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I wanted to start off by asking uh, a personal question to get to know you. Can you tell us a bit more about yourself? Where are you from? Where did you grow up? Oh, of course, yes, of course. Uh, well, now I identify as a New Yorker. I've uh, lived in New York uh, for the longest time out of all the places I've lived in my life. Uh, and uh, But I have uh, moved around quite a bit, especially at the beginning of my life. Uh, I was born in Baku, Azerbaijan, and uh, lived there till I till my teens uh, and then subsequently uh, because of the Armenian persecution uh, and uh, the war with Azerbaijan we had to be um, we had to leave and to apply for a refugee status and so we lived in uh, Russia for a few years on in a city called so we moved from Baku Azerbaijan to Rostov in Russia uh, which is a relatively big city on a big uh, river, a, a well-known city in New York, in um, in Russia, and then uh, and then of all places, after that we moved to California, San Diego, because that's where our sponsors were, their International Rescue Committee, uh, their office in San Diego, California, sponsored us as Armenian refugees, us, uh, me, and my family. Um, and then from California, from sunny California, which of course I loved, uh, I moved to New York to pursue school and uh, my education in uh, medical school and so forth. And although my plans were to leave New York, as you uh, probably heard this from many New Yorkers, one, once you live in New York, you can't live anywhere else. So uh, we uh, you know, now settled here and I'm a true uh, New Yorker and uh, love living this in this beautiful dynamic city where you can really see people from all cultures and um, all backgrounds. And it's, it's a melting pot, true melting pot of the world. Well, what an inspiring journey. I'm truly humbled by it. Why did you choose medicine and especially oncology to specialize? Of course, oncology, really attracted me by its uh, by its uh, unmet need and uh, the science of it and how you really, to be a good oncologist and to be an excellent physician scientist in that field, I think it's a perfect balance of uh, need to always problem, problem solve and not to be, um, you're never comfortable, you're always advancing and the science part of it. and 
basically in oncology, we don't read books. Uh, we read abstracts and papers. And, you know, if something is in the textbook, it's already outdated. So everything is so cutting edge and new and uh, moving forward at, at a rapid pace pace, which I always was attracted to, especially once I've spent even just one week at Memorial Sloan Kettering as a house uh, officer uh, training. But the other part of it, and I think it in some ways attracted me even more, is the compassion that you need and the resilience that you need to be there for your patients. And I remember when I told my parents, my mom, uh, that I wanted to be an oncologist, she was so surprised because, you know, and I think people ask me this at dinner parties all the time and cocktail parties as to why would you become be an oncologist? It's such a, a you know demanding and sad uh, profession. And I think that's part of it, uh, what attracted me that you need to be compassionate, you need to be resilient because these pa patients otherwise have really, you know, very little to go by other than what you can do for them and how you can make them feel while you're trying to help them. And that's what attracted me. What attracted me to medicine, I think it's probably similar to many of us as immigrants uh, and as uh, you know, first, first generation, you know, it's opportunity and, and it's the, the dream that you know, my, my mom, for example, had to become a physician. She wanted to be a physician all her life, but of course, living in Azerbaijan as a minority Armenian, you weren't allowed to go to med school. So uh, I was always good at science. I was a good student. And so uh, I went down that path, you know, as an opportunity. And then of course I fell in love with it. And again, the compassion part of it and the challenge part of it uh, is what really attracted me. Great, great. Uh, please tell us more about your uh, current role and uh, especially the tumor types uh, that you treat and you research on. So uh, similar to my, uh, you know, uh, career in uh, medicine uh, and uh, sort of getting into medicine by moving around, I moved around within the field of oncology quite a bit. When I first started as a researcher interested in oncology, actually a lot of the work that I did was in liquid tumors, treatment-related myelodysplastic syndrome. And that's what I thought I was going to focus on when I uh, went into fellowship. Uh, so in residency, I did a lot of TMDS, uh, you know, uh, uh, work. And then uh, while in oncology, I really pivoted uh, as a fellow to lung cancer because I was very interested in uh, the never smokers lung cancer. And this is during that period is when a lot of the EGFR mutations were discovered. And it was very nice to be part of the uh, team, you know, with Will Powell, uh, Vince Miller and others at MSK that were at the forefront making some of these uh, observations and discoveries that led to, you know, uh, uh, the characterization of acquired resistance with T790M mutations and lung cancer. Some of our trials that initially showed uh, response to dual EGFR blockade in those patients and so forth. Um, and then when I was applying for jobs as a junior early career investigator, it was an opportunity again in GI that presented uh, to me, the priority was to really stay at MSK because it was a, a unique place where you could get um, really a lot of research done quickly and answer questions, difficult to answer questions quickly because of the, the support in the clinical trial portfolio and the translational opportunities and lab-based research that was going on. So I pivoted to GI because that's where the opportunity was. And particularly since the HER2 story was uh, really developing in gastric cancer, and that was something I knew about, EGFR, the receptor superfamily, how to study acquired resistance, how to characterize tumors that are oncogene addicted. And so I pivoted to that as an opportunity uh, and uh, stayed on GI and has never regretted it. It's been an amazing, uh, opportunity as a scientist, as a physician, a huge challenge, obviously, GI tumors uh, in particular. Um, we started, I started my work with esophageal and gastric cancer, and because we had some successes and uh, challenges, but overall, how we overcome these challenges and grow is really what defines you as an investigator. And, you know, uh, six years ago or so, I was given an opportunity to head the service and become the service chief which was obviously a huge 
leap forward as a, as a physician a leader for me. And, and it was a great challenge again. Um, and uh, I've really enjoyed that part uh, of academic medicine, growing next generation of researchers, faculty, inspiring them to do more uh, science-based investigation and translational work. Um, and we've grown the service. I've grown the service tremendously since uh, taking over because there's this demand and also desire to really focus on GI tumors. There's an increase in incidence of all GI tumors, starting from the esophagus going down to the you know, colorectal cancer and pancreas cancer. Um, and so really we're hiring better, brighter, uh, more uh, sort of innovative uh, investigators than you know we've ever seen. And it's really great to see all these, this enthusiasm and uh, energy and talent going into GI space. And I'm there to help them grow and develop. So um, switching to GI has been a huge, uh, really opportunity for growth for me and others uh, in the field. Okay. Uh, speaking about uh, innovations, uh, what is the latest innovation in uh, gastric cancer with respect to number one, advanced setting? newly diagnosed advanced setting, and number two, in the recurrent metastatic setting. Right, so I think a lot of the development in gastric cancer has really been made in characterization of different subsets of tumors. We know that it's a rare disease in the United States, but globally, it's a very common problem with over a million cases diagnosed each year. And the type of gastric cancer that's declining in incidence is more your traditional, perhaps H. pylori um, or intestinal type uh, gastric cancer. But the G junction, gastroesophageal junction tumors are increasing and, and rapidly. In the United States, it's one of the uh, most, uh, the fastest increasing in incidence of cancers. Uh, and it's quite alarming. I think most of the development we've made was with characterization of the difference in these subsets, the molecular subtypes and how we can target them better and proving that immunotherapy works in these diseases. We can improve survival. And for the first time, there's long-term survival from patients with advanced metastatic tumors where most of our patients present with metastatic disease. So they need, so that we change the definition of cure where you can live with this disease and continue to enjoy your life and stay on therapy that's tolerable and offers you long-term survival. Um, so there's immunotherapy approval, there's targeted agents approval, targeting both HER2, for example, and also Claudin uh, inhibitors. So there's been, over the last five years or so, been major, major breakthroughs in metastatic disease. And now we're working on bringing those breakthroughs to early stage disease. Uh, and in some sets, we've been successful to do that, particularly for MSI, microsatellite and stable gastric and esophageal adenocarcinoma, um, also increasingly in HER2 positive disease. Um, and there's been some positive data in immunotherapy related treatments in early stage disease. We're waiting for confirmatory long term survival data to come through. So I think this wave of breakthroughs over the last five uh, to eight years has been focused on immunotherapy, on characterizing biomarker subsets. And what we're focused on next, particularly my group, and we formed a gastroesophageal uh, therapeutic accelerator at Memorial Sloan Kettering to help bring uh, collaborations and different data from different centers in US, Asia, Europe, Latin America, and, and we from investigators worldwide to to focus really on the undruggable subsets of these tumors, because a substantial subset, I would say more than 50% of those tumors don't have a specific oncogene addicted um, profile that we can focus on right at this moment with targeted agents. And really the next wave of breakthroughs will need to be in that subset of cancers. Okay, thank you. Uh is it fair to say that uh, immunotherapies, when they work, they really work and help the patients in the long term? But do we know upfront which patients are going to respond? That's a great question. Yes, there's a, approximately a quarter of our patients, 25% of patients have a long-term uh, outstanding response to immunotherapy and survival. Um, what, who those patients are, we probably know maybe 
10% of them who they are. And I can tell you, usually they're high tumor mutation burden or microsatellite unstable, or perhaps have high level of HER2 and PDL1 overexpression. But there is a subset of patients who we don't know why they have such an amazing response. And it could be both host and uh, tumor immune factors contributing to it. And that's where the uncertainty comes in because when patients come in, they want that reassurance. They want to know that they're gonna be long-term survivors. Um, and we offer people hope, uh, but who those patients are, we don't can't know for certain because we can predict, but not with 100% certainty. Okay. Uh, jumping to a different uh, tumor type, uh, pancreatic cancer has been pretty resistant to uh, any sort of innovation. So what is the message for the patients and uh, investigators and the physician community out there? What can uh, they look forward to with respect to pancreatic cancer? Well, the, me the message to the patients, the community, and the researchers is the same. Keep going. I think we're very close. I think pancreas has been one of those tumors where beyond chemotherapy, not a lot of uh, drugs have worked historically. Um, but there are breakthroughs coming. And I think part of it is because of foundations uh, like Glass Garden Foundation and others where uh, a large attention has been drawn to this historically, uh, historically difficult to treat tumor. Uh, and there's been a lot of research and funding going into uh, the effort, including the vaccine uh, prevention vaccine and also uh, post-operative vaccines to help reduce risk of recurrence. That's what our center is uh, really focused on. Um, and uh, also therapeutics. So of course, it's uniformly RAS mutant disease. And so improving RAS targeting, which has been in multiple iterations with different companies, uh, once there is one trial showing proof of principle, uh, you know, big pharma, biotechs, other philanthropy uh, foundations are directing a lot of effort toward this disease. So I think it's the next one for a major breakthrough. Thank you. Uh, that's very heartening to know. Uh, you are uh, a very active participant and member of several associations, most uh, notably the ASCO and ESMO. Can you outline broadly uh, what, how you contribute to these societies? Are you part of any committees and so on? Yes, absolutely. It's uh, really, ASCO and ESMO are important vehicles for us to disseminate our research and to engage the next generation of talent. And that's what, uh, whenever I'm given opportunity to either present or host a seminar or lead a, com a, a committee, um, I this is what my goal is, is to, uh, because I know that in my lifetime as an oncologist, I am unlikely to solve every problem, right? And so I need to make sure that I leave behind a legacy of people like me or people who are exponentially better, smarter, more driven, you know, more persistent than me. And that's what these societies uh, let us do. So um, I'm involved with several committees and um, also some of them are uh, uh, confidential. So I, you know, cause they haven't been announced uh, yet, but uh, visibility with these committees are, are, are important. Uh, and it's, sometimes it's, you know, it's, uh, it's time consuming and uh, challenging, but you are making a big difference because of that piece. You're inspiring the next generation and not any less important, you're also disseminating a message of research and a message of hope to patients, caregivers, and clinicians who are in the in clinic day to day, they may not have the outlet of creativity that I have the privilege of having, which is research. And they also may not be sub, sub, sub specialized. So they're not treating one particular disease. They're treating all the cancers. So to them, they rely on these educational sessions to understand how an expert like me, for example, in gastric cancer approaches the disease. Yesterday, I saw 33 patients with the same 
or similar type of cancer, right? Gastroesophageal cancer. So to me, these decisions are uh, so uh, nuanced that teaching someone in the community who may not see this disease very common, especially since it's a rare subset of cancers, to allow that the patients who are getting care outside of a tertiary cancer center get to get access to the advances that we made as researchers in a place like Memorial Sloan Kettering is the reason why I stay involved with these societies and I continue to further their mission um, is, you know, ultimately to improve patient care. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, being a physician scientist and uh, doing uh, academic research as well as uh, participating to industry-led uh, clinical trials, is there a particular tumor type within the gastrointestinal oncology part where uh, you think, my God, why is no one taking a look at this? Why is no one researching this tumor? Is there a particular tumor that you think along those lines? Um, well, I think, I think uh, for, sh for, it, for a long time, it's been the case for gastric and esophageal adenocarcinoma. Uh, I remember as faculty, junior faculty, trying to get uh, investigator initiated trial concepts approved um, based on idea that I had or, or basic science paper that I came across that I said, you know, this pathway or this biology would really apply to our patients because of um, X, Y, and Z. And I think the in gastric cancer and esophageal cancer, what lacked historically is the models of the disease because for biologic experiments preclinically, you really need a good transgenic model or other models to mimic the biology so then you can demonstrate efficacy or importance of a certain pathway. And I think slowly by generating patient-derived xenografts, organoids, but also uh, models of the cancer in the lab, we've been able to break through that uh, barrier. Um, and also by doing studies, positive studies that the disease um, responded. So, you know, I think in gastric and esophageal, we can continue to improve on that and then there are subsets of disease, such as peritoneal disease, peritoneal carcinomatosis, where the, there's nothing going on of, of, uh, uh, to improve outcome because peritoneal disease often fails all standard therapy. Um, so I think there's still a lot to do in gastric, uh, but uh, you know, certainly uh, these niche subsets of cancers is where the opportunity is because if you show any positive signal, it really goes a, a, a huge uh, way uh, for a trial. Thank you. Uh, final, not a question, but uh, a general advice. What would be your uh, advice to a uh, budding oncologist who would like to specialize in gastrointestinal oncology? What would be your advice and message to them? I think the advice and message is if you start a project, finish it, see it to a conclusion, and um, try to learn as much as you can early on before your clinical administrative and other research responsibilities get um, you know, too broad. Learn as much as you can of skills that you could contribute to a team, uh, some unique skill set. For example, you know, if you have an opportunity to go to a lab meeting or even be in the lab for one or two years as a trainee, even if you say to yourself, I will never have my own big lab or I don't want to be a lab PI, still take an opportunity and learn skills and perspective that you would not get later on in life because um, these type of learning just for the sake of learning and understanding certain hard processes will give you an enormous advantage when you're seeing patients in clinic, when you're making observations, when you're trying to come up with the next big thing. Um, and I think, you know, all of us need to be more um, daring, take risks and go for really big discoveries and not just incremental changes. I challenge myself to do that every day. And it's sometimes difficult uh, because, you know, um, these cancers are very challenging, but I think if we all challenge each other, um, you know, it's, we will just get more done. Thank you. Thank you. On that note, uh, thanks a lot for your time. It was very inspiring to hear your story from uh, Azerbaijan to uh, 
uh, the US and now as an international recognized key opinion leader in gastrointestinal oncology. We are very thankful for your time. Thank you so much. It was a great, great questions and thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Bye. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to Onka Daily on YouTube. Hit the bell icon to stay updated.